Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Bagpipe Report. I am Blake Norton, and this week we've got all the news. We've got a review of last Sunday's WWE Survivor Series and part two of our exclusive in-studio interview with D'Lo Brown. Okay, joining us on the line right off the bat is Brian Alvarez from the Figure Four Weekly Newsletter from Washington. You can check it out at WrestlingObserver.com. How are you doing this week, Brian? I'm doing pretty good. Good. Now, I want to start with NWA TNA. We were talking a week or two ago about um, the guys are bringing in on top, Hall and Nash and Randy Savage, and basically that the, it, it costs more money to bring them in, and because they've been around a while and they haven't grown with the company, they're not going to inspire the same kind of loyalty that you might get from a lot of people with the company. And sure enough, about, I suppose, you'd say about 20 minutes into debuting with NWA TNA, Randy Savage was gone, and they wound up having to rewrite the entire next uh, Impact show. But now apparently he's coming back. Uh, what have you heard about the situation? Uh, well, apparently Savage showed up, and Hogan was there, and mm. uh, Savage does not like Hogan. Yes, and, indeed. And uh, Hogan tried to smooth things over with him, and Savage wanted none of it, and so he quit. And I don't know if Hogan called him and they actually talked, but I think that they must have had some sort of communication because Savage ended up coming back, and I think he's going to make a challenge to Hogan to have a match in the ring which makes me think that they must have smoothed things over because uh, uh, Savage and Hogan for like well over a decade yeah. had this weird love-hate relationship yeah. where they hate each other yeah. unless there's the possibility of them making money, in which case they love each other. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think that that's what must have happened here because it seems strange for Savage to quit and then unquit. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I figure something must have gone down, but uh, yeah, Savage is back. Uh, there. Except the only thing is, nothing is confirmed with Hogan yet, so... It, it, it does seem very far-fetched at this point. I mean, we haven't even seen Savage in ring gear yet in a couple of years, so... I don't think you'll see him in ring gear for a few more months. Actually. Oh? Why is that? I don't think he's in very good shape. Oh, well, last time I saw him was a few years ago. He was in great shape then, but of course, a few years, if you're not in the gym, who knows? We shall see. Uh, moving right along, um, have you heard about Birchall? Does that name ring a bell with you? Virtual. Well, I'll tell you, he's the newest uh, WWE developmental wrestler. He's heading to Ohio Valley very soon. Oh, the guy from the UK. That's right. And yeah. uh, he is a big name over here with the FWA. Very big, very agile big man. He does uh, st standing shooting star presses uh, on the mat, all sorts of stuff. Um, I'm trying to think how tall he is. I haven't met him. I think he's, he's definitely well over that six foot. Amazingly agile. So he is heading to Ohio Valley Wrestling. And uh, what can uh, fans of the UK over here hope for. Uh, do you think he's got a chance in WWE? Have you heard any buzz about him? Well, the main question is uh, how tall is he again? He's he's over the six foot region. He, he's not going to get buried with his height. I mean, he's big over here. How, but how, uh, how muscular is he? Quite. He, okay, he, he's fine. a big guy. <laughs> get that, shot. That's all that matters. Of course. I mean, th that's the thing, though. Is, I mean, it's all. I mean, the indie scene guys are so much smaller, you know, comparatively to to WWE. So I think. I mean, he looks very big over here. But when he makes his illusion. when he makes his yeah when he makes his debut, whether it's on Heat or whatever it is, if he makes his debut six months down the line, people are gonna go. He's lost four inches, or he's lost six inches, but but no, it's just a land of the big men. Okay, let's move right ahead. Best of luck to Burchill uh, in his WWE career. Uh, the on-demand service, starting from WWE. I thought it was kind of funny. The promo was on Survivor Series, but they've got AWA, Vern Gagne, I believe. Uh, they have uh, WCW, obviously, ECW, WWE. And it's so funny because, I mean, Vince doesn't need to care because he's so rich. But he has screwed up the ECW and WCW brand so badly, I wanted to laugh out loud when I saw them show the WCW brand and then suggest that you pay money to see it. Because on WWE television, up to this very day, Booker T, uh, you know, everybody from WCW and everybody from ECW, which they brought in just to kill it off in like two months. Uh, in fact, in about 20 minutes in 2001. Uh, it really seems to me to be a bit ironic that they're now trying to sell the product, isn't it? 
Yeah, the, the one thing, uh, I, I wasn't really paying too much attention to that commercial, but I did notice when they did the w, WCW stuff, there's like a huge shot of uh, Booker T. Mm-hmm. And when they did the ECW stuff, there's a huge shot of Taz. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think, I don't know if Vince knows how much damage he's really done to both brands. Yeah. But yeah. I think they figure, okay, maybe these people don't know what these two companies are. <laughs> maybe they never watched a lot of ECW. So we'll take two of our superstars <laughs> Our current superstars, Booker mm-hmm. and Taz, and we'll put them all over it. Maybe that'll compel people to uh, give it a shot. Right, Be- because people are buying so few pay-per-views these days, maybe they prefer to pay pay- uh, buy pay-per-views to see the same guys from 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, very weird. But, uh, in some cases, they get much better wrestling. <laughs> That's very, very true. WCW, man, WCW, when they were going downhill, they still had a lot of good matches. They did. Uh, um, moving right along, Shaniqua has been released. That's really, I don't think there's really anything much to be said about that. Um, I have something to say. I can't shoot. believe it took this long. Yeah, actually, yeah, we, we all thought this was going to happen like February, didn't we? Yeah. Which you sent back down to Ohio Valley. I, no disrespect, but we, we thought it was coming quite a while. Um, okay, let's move right on now to the Survivor Series. Uh, my overall th- thoughts on the show started off good. Uh, really good cruiserweight match to open things up. Got me riled up. A couple of good, not pay-per-view, but fun matches. But by the end, it was petering out. And by the end, again, you get that sense. And this is what I, I, th- I really feel that people in the front office of WWE aren't recognizing is that it's very well and good to put together a show and say it was pretty good or whatever, but but for you to buy a pay-per-view, a three-hour show, over looking at a two-hour, like four hours of prime time, unquote, wrestling per week, the pay-per-view was $35 to a guy on the street with a regular job. The weekly show is four hours of free wrestling. You have to give a lot of payoff for that 35 bucks. And again, we just didn't get the, the 35 buck worth of payoff. What was your overall impression of the show, first of all? Uh, I thought it was better than a lot of the lame WWE pay-per-views that have been uh, uh, presented. I think it had a better months. feel too, a better Big Show feel. But yeah, it, it was. I think. I mean, it was a better show overall. The matches, you know, you you had two good matches to open the show. You had a pretty good main event. Uh, the middle dragged, but yeah. you know, it was expected to drag with what they put out there. Although. Mm. I, I am appalled at the length of the Heidenreich Undertaker match. I have no idea what they were thinking. I, I know. It's like, I, 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 I come away with it thinking, obviously they booked the match that long. It was like 15 or 20 minutes to make Heidenreich look like he's not just another guy who's going to lose to The Undertaker. But at the end of the day, he's a he guy... He just another guy that lost, he to, lost the to The Undertaker. And, and the part I don't get as well is that, I mean, I, I, the match wasn't terrible. I mean, people are going in thinking that the apocalypse is going to happen. It wasn't terrible, but it was clear from the end of it that Heidenreich doesn't really have much of a future in the ring. And the fact that they oh, didn't... come on now. The fact that they didn't build up his, his pay-per-view match... You tell me I'm negative. The fact that they built up his pay-per-view match by doing everything but have him in the ring should tell you something and I find it weird that of all the people to try and make look good against The Undertaker they picked Heidenreich because I think he's kind of the last guy they're going to be pushing as an in-ring kind of character wouldn't you? Well sometimes WWE is smart in that everything they did with Heidenreich leading up to this match was very very smart yeah it was completely words, the right way to do it in the ring. Yeah. he just beat people up and went crazy Yeah. and then sometimes they're really stupid because mm-hmm. uh, there was no reason to make this match Go that go long. Go 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, if you want to make it long, make it eight. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's long for Heidenreich. Come yeah, on now. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was a disaster. But uh, going back to the show, the um, I'm thinking about the main event, as we always talk about when the show's over, uh, do people go, oh, I can't wait for the next show, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And the thing was, like we talked about last week, the heels were talking about what was going to happen when they won and all these stipulations and what they were going to do with Raw. And they spent a whole week basically hyping up the heels winning. And it made you really look forward to it, didn't it? Yeah, you were kind of going, oh, man, you're going to see, you know, Big Dave is going to challenge Hunter. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they didn't do it. So the the Bayface has got to win. And the Bayfaces have not yet once talked about what they're going to do. Uh, What is Maven going to do on Raw? I want to know. Yeah, Monday Night Maven. We were thinking about that. For for the wrong reasons, though. I I don't want to know for the same reasons that I want to know what Snitsky would do with Raw. It's it's kind of a bad reason. Actually, I want to know. I was looking forward to Monday Night Gene, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, the Maven thing, yeah, I don't know. 
but uh, it's like they gave us something that we weren't expecting, but it was the sort of thing where we weren't expecting it because we were more excited to really see something else. Yeah, yeah, so, which, which is uh, the wrong reason to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let, let's kick it off the top. Um, does it? It seems to me that if they were going to do something with Chavo versus Kidman, that they would have put the title on Kidman in the cruiserweight match. Not only did they not put the title on Kidman or make him look special. Chavo did the job in the match. Is, is this program just dead in the water? Have they just let it go and just going to end I think it's pretty much dead at this point. Yeah. Uh, I have no, you know, I don't understand the booking of that match. I do understand that they don't care about the cruiserweight division, which yeah. is the only thing that I can figure out. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, Spike. Spike. Spike Dudley. Mm -hmm. like, like the one guy that looked like he came out of the crowd mm -hmm. won the match. Yeah. And yeah. that was appalling. Yeah, yeah. Um, Benjamin versus Christian. Uh, both guys look good. Uh, there was good reports from their matches at house shows, and they really delivered. I thought it was a very solid match, and Benjamin really looked like a million bucks. So I'm starting to build, uh, buy the slow build because he's had a quirky on-off year. Injury didn't help. Uh, Ross was selling with something really special at the end. Do you think we're going to get a major Sheldon Bush push in the next six months, or are they going to hold off? Right now. Uh, right uh, now? I think they've, they've done a great job with yeah. him as far as he's just beating everybody. Uh, and uh, it's like the oldest, it's the oldest trick in the book to get a guy over and to have him beat people, to yeah. have him win a lot of matches. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> shockingly, they figured this out, and he's winning a lot of matches. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If they're not yeah. careful, he's going to get over. No, like, <laughs> not getting too cute about it, which is a good thing a lot of the time. But what I mean is, I mean, are they going to keep him uh, like on a hot streak in the mid card, or do you think they're going to try and hot? Because I mean, they hot shotted Randy Orton, and that went really badly. And and Orton is still trying to rehab. He's still, I mean, people are warming to him a bit again, but I mean, he is nowhere near the momentum he had three months ago. Well, the difference is Orton was Hunter's personal project, and Benjamin is not. Mm -hmm. so is that good or bad for Benjamin? Hot shot, which yeah. will probably be better off for Benjamin. Right, right. Okay, let's move right ahead. Uh, Tigger versus Heidenreich, ten foot pole. We already touched it. Uh, Lita versus Trish. I suppose are they just putting that match off to WrestleMania now with that finish? I think they're just prolonging it because people want to see it, which isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, I could live the rest of my life without ever seeing a girl bleed in wrestling again. Yeah. But. Uh, um, I think people who paid to see Trish didn't pay to see her bleed. They could salvage yeah. this, actually, by... Because she was really only bleeding a very small amount. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, the Vince Russo in me is thinking of all these comedy angles. Like, she comes back in a, a mask or something crazy because of the destruction to her face. But uh, that would sort of kill the whole program. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that, that's, 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 a, that's a good way to move on right there. Uh, JBL versus Booker. Um, for my, my, I mean, I, like I said, I like JBL. I think Book is very solid, although the last year or two he hasn't been as hot. Um, these guys, for my money, just didn't click. And the overbooking really, I mean, by the end of the match, people were kind of going, come on, you know, we've seen enough of the, the, the horse thing around with Orlando Jordan going in and out and in and out and in and out. And uh, I think the fact that, that uh, Bradshaw won, I mean, if they're going to keep the title on, on uh, Bradshaw, they should have just had him go over clean because it's not like Booker is on the greatest hot streak of his career right now or anything. I mean, it was, it was pretty much a last-minute babyface turn because they didn't have anyone to wrestle Bradshaw on this pay-per-view. So, I mean, I, I really think that if they're going to do anything with Bradshaw or if they want to have the title hot when they, hold, when they give it to someone else, they really should have put him over there. Well, they did every, uh, like every, actually I can't say every because they didn't break a table, but they did a lot of cheap tricks to, uh, to make the match better than it should have been, like the stuff on the outside of the ring and everything. And the, the, the chemistry just wasn't there, though. No, I, I, think, I thought the last two minutes were good. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't so much mind all the interference until Ric Flair got kicked out for doing one thing after Orlando had done 60. I know. But that's more Flair being hurt. He couldn't be out there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, you know, it was a long title match that nobody cared about until the last two minutes. And Right. We talked about that. Right. Uh, speaking of Ric Flair, actually, before we go to the main, um, what is the status of him right now? He's got some sort of, I know this sounds bad with Ric Flair, but a groin-related issue. Uh, something, something Some people will say he's had there. that for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it hasn't been an issue until recently. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he, he's, uh, he's, it may be a torn groin, but they're not sure yet, so right, right, uh, right. I guess they have to uh, figure out what's wrong with him, but he's, he's not feeling good. Which you would never know from watching him. Yeah, yeah. He's not even supposed to be walking, and he's down there running around like an idiot, uh, yeah. throwing a fit. Yeah. So yeah. he's Ric Flair. He's Ric Flair. He's the man. And uh, now going into uh, Raw, where do you see things going from here? Are, are, is this a thumbs up or a thumbs down coming out storyline-wise? 
it's a thumbs in the middle right now because I have no idea what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know. I, I, I just got to say, I mean, in the main event, I mean, the baby faces look so damn weak. I mean, there's one point where Randy Orton comes in and attacks Snits Snitsky, and he's not even looking, and Snitsky just smacks him around and kicks him out of the ring. And I'm thinking, this is the guy challenging for the title at Mania? It was like, that was very odd. And then there's well, they like Snitsky. I, I suppose they do, but it seemed very odd to me. And then there's another point where Big Dave just runs through. I think it was Jericho and Benoit. And it's like, well, you know, I mean, I, I understand that, but shouldn't it be like Dave and Hunter running through one of the baby faces? They're so weird. I mean, they seem to be booking all the baby faces to look like losers. Well, I, I knew this. I, I kind of knew this was going to happen. I thought it would be much worse where <laughs> one of the baby faces would turn and screw everybody out of the match mm. because the baby faces had just gotten way too much heat in the last three weeks. Mm. And something was bound to go wrong. The problem was they were getting heat. They were so stupid. They were getting heat like three on two with three baby faces and two heels. Which and that just makes you feel sympathy for the bad guys. It's not. It's the most backwards thing that I've seen since WCW died, to be honest with you. Because mm -hmm. they used to do the same thing. They have all these. In fact, TNA's doing it right now with Hall and Nash beating up eight men. Yeah. But, uh, and then on this show, it's like the revenge was they just got killed in a fair fight. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know who's booking this, but. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing. And uh, I, I don't know what to say about these next few shows because we haven't been, you know, there's been no hype for them. There's been hype yeah, for the heels, yeah, yeah. and the heels didn't get it. Yeah. So, I, people, uh, people, I, people always say that like wrestling should be unpredictable, but you should know what you want. You should have a sense. You know, you should have, like, I want this or this or this. It, it should leave you wanting something and waiting for something that you feel is around the corner. I mean, even with unpredictable, it shouldn't be unpredictable where when it's over you're like, oh, my gosh, I never saw that coming. Yeah. It should be more like um, something happens that you didn't expect but it makes sense in that they've been uh, pleasantly surprised that time. fits into place, like it's the missing yeah, piece of the fit. puzzle. Yeah. And the yeah. thing with Russo was all his unpredictability didn't fit. He would lead everybody in one direction, so they really wanted to see something happen. Then he would give them something they totally didn't expect and also had no desire to see. Hmm. And this made him happy. It made everybody else upset. And he didn't understand that because he was built. He was born like. When he loved watching wrestling, it was the stuff in the 80s where you'd have a swerve. But it would be a swerve that had been built up for a year to make sense. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan, Elizabeth, Love Triangle, whatever. Yeah. You know, they'd been planning Brilliant. that for mm -hmm. like a year. Mm -hmm. Like they'd had little subtle things that they did a year earlier that nobody saw except Vince and four other people. But it was a build for this. Mm -hmm. And Russo didn't understand that. And that's what he did in the dying days of WCW. And that's really what they did here was they gave us something that that they'd hyped up something completely different and made us expect something different that we wanted to see, and now they're giving us something that we don't have any idea what's going to happen, and we don't know if you even want to see it. So, Pay-per-view thumbs in the middle, Vince Russo thumbs down. Yes. He, 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 Two he, thumbs he, down. He, 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 he's gone, Brian. Let it go. Let no, it go. I can't. Let, let it go, Brian. Let I know go. he's going to come let back. I know he passed the letter to TNA at let, that pay-per-view. Plotting the, something. The, where's the love, Brian? I don't have any love. Uh, not for Vince Russo, apparently. Um, Brian, thank you very much for joining us this week. We will be back with you next week to once again review the week in professional wrestling. And very Vince Russo. I'll and very here. Vince Russo for absolutely no need at this point. There's always going to be a need. <laughs> WrestlingObserver.com. He's the editor of the Figure Four Weekly Newsletter. Take care of yourself, Brian. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Now, moving into 99, um, your character seemed to go in different directions. You were tag team with Mark Henry. That yeah. didn't work out. They finally put you back singles again, and you had another strong run. You had a series of matches with Jeff Jarrett. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I remember correctly, you held both the IC and Euro straps yes. at the same time, which is a major push which, for anybody. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was the equivalent of a World Heavyweight Championship. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we had the match with, you know, with, uh, you know, with Jeff Jarrett, and I really thought at that point um, the character of D'Lo was on track. Ready to, 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 to boil step over. to yeah. step from this level to the to the upper echelon. I right. was re I really believed it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I was watching last night, at, hanging out with a bunch of uh, uh, cool guys at a bar last night, and we had a DVD of mine put together. And mm -hmm. look, listen to some of the reactions when I'd come out and during that run with me and Jeff Jarrett, like SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, you know, I was you could see it. Everyone could see you were just ready to step up. Momentum, man. It was there, mm -hmm. and um, everyone thought I was I was pegged to, 
to step up next to the uh, to the immortals, is for a better lack of a better word. And what do you think happened? I don't have a clue. Mm. Um, I think it had a lot to do with. Um, I think uh, a lot to do with uh, Vince Russo leaving the company. Mm. That's right about the time when he left. That's exactly the time. Yes. Um, it, w was it difficult then when Russo left? Were, were people that, that he liked and people they pushed, was it tougher on them? I think it was. And if you, if you had the tag of being one of Russo's boys, one of the guys Russo wanted to help create, mm -hmm. um, it might have been a case of, okay, let's, let's bring these guys back down a peg. Because mm -hmm. um, immediately after that, Jeff Jarrett jumped to WCW. That's right. Yeah. And went over to be, you know, continue his run, ironically, under Russo. That's right, yeah. Um, and I was one of the last one of, quote unquote, Russo's boys remaining on the roster. Mm -hmm. And um, after SummerSlam 99, I pretty think I had, you know, one more run with the European belt. Well, Mark Henry and I had one more run. I had two more runs of the European belt, but it was never the same. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't the same. I, they say that if you're going to succeed in WWE, like a lot of companies, you need someone batting for you in the front office. Do you find that to be the case? Uh, I, I think that's true in any company, mm -hmm. uh, any wrestling company. You, you need, there's only so much you can do on your end in the ring. Mm -hmm. And the fans help you out, but there has to be someone you know, batting for you, um, keeping your name there on mm. the forefront of everyone's mind. Mm. And um, I think I lost that and um, never recovered from, you know, 99, 2000, 2001, went straight to hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. um, and then out the door in, in 03. There was that that gimmick now where uh, you and... I know uh, where you're going. Don't, oh my God. Sorry. Um, I know where, you don't even have to say it. I know where you're going. And I've got to tell you, it was the lowest point in my life. and. and I'm always proud of myself and always proud of this business and this industry. I, I don't know if people can hear the passion I have for this, this business. I love it. Mm -hmm. But when I'm looking in my bag and I see a turban and I see genie pants and curly toe boots, mm -hmm. for the first time I was embarrassed to be a pro wrestler. Mm -hmm. I was embarrassed for this industry and for this sport and didn't even want to be associated with it. I'm, I, I look and I'm like, what? And I'm like, is it worth it? And, I'm, and I, I'm, I was your Continental Champion for Pete's sake, and now I'm a genie. I'm Aladdin. Mm. It, it, uh, one of the, you know, worst times on camera I've ever had. And just to walk through, the, walk around the back wearing that next to the boys, knowing you, the sneakers. Look at that! I'm glad I'm not wearing that. Mm. <clears throat> well, what did the office tell you? Um, it started out with. Chaz and I were doing a tag team called Lowdown, mm -hmm. which everyone kind of everyone was getting with. Mm -hmm. And then um, someone had the bright idea to bring Tiger Ali Singh as our manager, and then then we started doing the things. Where, and three weeks later, three weeks earlier, Chaz and I are beating the Dudley Boys in the middle of the ring on Raw. To three weeks later, we're doing it at an angle where they won't let us in the building because they don't know who we are. I, I've never understood that kind of writing where it's like, I'm not sure if it's meant to be a hook or what, but the only thing I can imagine that possibly doing is making you look bad. I can't and, imagine that selling a ticket. That or, didn't, I, I, that wouldn't have sold one, my family wouldn't have bought a ticket to that. Yeah. And if, you know, if you can't sell a ticket to your own family, then what can you do? Um, I don't know what that was meant to do, whether that was to, to totally escort us out the door, totally kill any remnants of any of the past off. Right. But that was just um, a bad time for me. That mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. was bad, brutal. Now we talked about uh, uh, difficult situations with Owen. There's of course the one with you and Darren Drozdov. Yeah, that's the lowest point in my life, not just in wrestling, my life. Um, in this business, you have to trust your opponent. You trust them with everything you got because you trust with your life, because this is about two people working together. Mm -hmm. And when someone gets hurt in the ring, whether it be your fault or not, you carry that with you. And um, you know, Darren and I, we, we have watched the video, we've talked about it, we don't know what happened, what went wrong. Um, and, and it was, you know, I, a move I've done a hundred times, running powerball, mm -hmm. a move I've done with him a hundred times. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had experts, quote unquote wrestlers, experts come in and watch it, and they didn't have a clue. And to this day, I still don't know what happened. Just something went wrong. And, and you know, to have someone get hurt on your watch and get hurt that severely, you carry that with you forever. And it, that changed me as a person, as a worker. Um, I was a heartbeat away from retiring. Um, I didn't come the next raw the next week. 
uh, and people were wondering where I was. The officer was on the phone with me. I had Jim Ross talking to me daily. Um, and finally, I came back and it was like, okay, let's, let's go ahead and do this. I want to end, you know, have two careers end on the same night. Um, but that's something that, uh, you know, I think about every day. There's never a day that doesn't go by I don't think about that. And that's, you try to move past things, you can't move past something like that. It's there, it's always in the forefront of your mind. And, you know, I've never done that move again. I, there will be never a circumstance where I'll use it again. Um, just, uh, uh. What is your relationship with him like at this point? We were never friends before. Um, we weren't friends after. We, we talked a few times um, and we emailed a couple times back and forth, but um, we really don't have that much contact at all. Does that make it more difficult for you? Yeah, because there's, there's not closure. There's, you know, you just want to see how things are going. And, um, you know, it caused a lot of tension with his wife, who, um, you know, that was a sad, that was a sad, you know, certain situation. Um, and, you know, it was never like you go out there and you want to hurt somebody. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to kill this guy today. Mm -hmm. It could have easily been me, and there are times I wish it was me. I mean, I just happened to be the unfortunate guy in the ring with him that day, and he happened to be the unfortunate guy in the ring with me that day. And it was just a bad day all in, all in general. And I, once again, it's something I hope never happens again. If you were to turn around with that experience and use it in a positive sense to, to give something positive to the business as a result of what you've learned and what mm -hmm. you've experienced, what, what would it be? Well, and that's why I'm so much of a stickler for kids learning how to do this the right way, proper training. Because things like that, if two professionals can go out there and something happens like that, well, a young kid starting in this industry without the proper training can happen to a lot faster. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, if you've ever seen me do a training seminar or, or teach a kid or even before a show, I see some kid run the ropes the wrong way, I will stop and go, okay, here's how you need to do it. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is how it works for me. This has been the safe way for me. And I'm a stickler, okay, keep doing it until you get it right. And don't try this until you got it right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the positive that came out of it. I'm much more in tuned and, and trying to show people how to do this mm -hmm. the correct way. Because there's a lot of people out there who play at wrestling but aren't wrestlers. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion then of a lot of, th there is so many, ta so many wrestlers, unquote, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but there's a lot of new guys coming up in, particularly around the US right now, mm -hmm. and there's so many training schools out there, and you yeah. don't need any credential to be a wrestler. Yeah, there's, there's no, and we talked about this off camera, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no, wrestling 101 handbook on the proper way to train people. And I see situations where a kid is two weeks out of training himself. His boots that he ordered came in the mail, mm -hmm. and then two days later he's opening up his own school. Well, how can you do that? Mm -hmm. You don't even know what you're doing. You're still wet behind the ears yourself, and now you're teaching someone else how to do this. That's right. um, any, any Tom, Dick, or Harry with a pair of boots can call himself a wrestler. That doesn't make you a worker. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between being a wrestler and a worker. Um, I just wish there was some kind of standard on who was allowed to train. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I've been fortunate enough, I've seen a lot of training centers around UK and, and Ireland. You know, there's a lot of positive things out there. I see some good kids in the FWA school, I see good things in the WZW school. I've been over here and I saw the, the IWW school and I see good things. Mm -hmm. But then you go, and I won't name the bad schools, I, I, you know, I've seen where it's like you walk in there and just from the minute you walk in, Oh, someone's gonna get hurt. Mm -hmm. Someone's gonna get hurt. Because guys are learning how to do 360 shooting star, leg drop, Fosbury flip dives, and they don't even know how to lace their boots up right. Can't body slam without dropping the guy in his head. Yeah, they, can't take a bump they don't know how to lace their boots up, but yet they're cl the first thing they climb, they run in, they climb right at the top rope and try to jump off and mm -hmm. you know, imitate AJ Styles. Mm -hmm. You know, I use AJ Styles because he's a worker mm -hmm. and he's safe at what he does. He used a high impact style, but the kid's a worker and he flies. You gotta learn how to work. You gotta learn how to crawl before you can walk. And some kids are trying to run. They haven't even, you know, haven't even started crawling yet. Define for our fans um, a worker versus a wrestler because there's a big, big difference. A worker, it's a totally different lifestyle. A worker is someone who eats, breathes, sleeps this industry and tries to promote this industry and get it better. And they're guys who go in the ring and, and, and practice the art of, 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 of working the crowd and the illusion. I'll give you um, Bret Hart's a good worker. 
Ric Flair is a good worker. Um, even in his own way, Hulk Hogan is a good worker. Wrestlers are guys, there are wrestlers out there who just get boots and start jumping around. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference, you see guys in the upper echelon, you wonder, you see a guy as a fan, you're like, oh, he's good, oh my God, he's good, he's good. And then you watch the other guy going, he's gonna kill himself. Mm -hmm. there's, an easy, there's, there's an easy thing right there. The kid is gonna kill himself, he wants to be a wrestler. What is your opinion then of, because of course working is so much grounded in creating an illusion, making something bigger than it physically is, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the strong style, the stiff style. There's no such thing as strong style. Mm -hmm. That's just a bunch of kids just getting rocks off and hitting the hell out of each other, knocking teeth out mm -hmm. to impress the, the people they sold tickets to. Take it from a guy who goes to Japan every day. I, I, I go to Japan two weeks out of every month. I'm in Japan more than I am home. There's no such thing as stiff, strong style in Japan. Whenever you see a clip of, of someone knocking the piss out of each other in Japan, it's usually a veteran knocking out, slapping a dojo boy mm -hmm. because that's their way of training. Mm -hmm. um, there's no fun in kicking somebody as hard as you can. If you want to do that, join the UFC. You want to punch somebody as hard as you want, go try boxing. Mm -hmm. We are artists. We are illusionists. We are improv, um, but we're not we wrestle to protect somebody. We're not just out there to kill somebody. Mm -hmm. um, the art is doing it without killing them or hurting them, making you think I'm killing them and I'm hurting them. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, you have a good night, you go in the back, you enjoy what you just did, you relax. You don't come back and see a guy who's all black and blue, blood coming out of his, his face and three teeth missing going, oh brother, that was great, give me my $25. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And no, that's not great. You've got about a two minute lifespan in this business. If, if you're gonna wrestle like that. You know, guys like that are called shooting stars. They, they're here today and gone tomorrow. You know, workers are guys that last 10, 15, 20 years, and that's the key to being a worker is longevity, not, mm -hmm. oh my God, he's gonna, he, when's he gonna come down? It, it, is it a conflict then, because you've worked with Vince Russo so much back in WWE and in WATNH, we'll talk about in a moment. He, a lot of guys like him, a lot of guys dislike him, mm -hmm. and usually the dislike is because people say he doesn't understand the business and he exposes wrestling and takes the emphasis off of the illusion and puts it on, on other aspects, like, mm -hmm. like quick storyline turnarounds right. and seedier storylines. The people who endorse him say that he's a good guy with good intentions who goes out there and pushes people who deserve to be pushed. Uh, is it difficult for you to work with him because of course he pushed you, he saw the talent you had. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he has done many things that have pulled the curtain back, whether it's insider terminology or having Buff Bagwell throw the match on Nitro, which of course sort of exposes wrestling to people who don't need it exposed right, right. to. Is it difficult to... I use that double-edged sword again because I, you know, either Vince Russo, you, you like him or you hate him, there's no in-between. Mm -hmm. I personally, I love him. He's mm -hmm. a real good friend of mine. Um, it's good to go out there and work with somebody who, who sees talent in you and tries to put it out in the forefront and run with it. Mm. On the other side, you know, there are things that he'll throw out a thousand storylines and maybe 99% of them are a little over the edge. Mm. And then there's that one that's great, but no one sees the one great one because the 99, they're over the edge. Right. Um, you know, it is, it is rough going out there with the, with the CD storylines because there's, you know, I don't want to see that all the time. That's not wrestling to me. Mm. Wrestling is two guys going out there fighting and the winner gets paid more. Yeah. And that's a lost art. Fighting because I want your championship, because mm -hmm. I get paid more if I'm a champion. Mm -hmm. That's gone. Mm -hmm. um, now it's more of a soap opera, and, and that's a sad part of it. Um, you know, I love what Russo has done in certain circumstances, and I dislike what he's done in others. Uh, but for the most part, I like Russo as an individual. <laughs> Now, in 2003, you were let go from WWE. What was the situation? I mean, it had literally been years since they had done something meaningful with you. Mm -hmm. Did you have a hope up until they let you go? I mean, just before you got let go, they changed your gimmick again for about the umpteenth time yeah. to like a street ghetto. You know, and, and there was hope because um, I had done the, the, the Saturday Night Heat thing, or the, or the Sunday Night Heat thing, I was doing commentary. That's right, yeah. And, uh, Triple H was like, you know, we're wasting him behind the TV. He should be in the ring. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, okay, here's finally the endorsement I need again to get maybe another run. Right. So I get back in the ring and I come right in and they throw me right at William Regal for the European title again. I'm thinking, okay, here we go. We're gonna do this again. And then, you know, lose to William Regal. I lose to him in a, in a really good way. I'm thinking, okay, they can further the storyline. Never saw him again. Mm -hmm. There was always the, the easy angle of Battle of the Frog Splash between Van Damme and Guerrero and myself. 
mm-hmm. never came around. Mm-hmm. And then, then I go on TV and I'm a racist. Mm-hmm. And anyone who knows me, that's the furthest thing from me. But I've got to go do it because I want to be on. I want to get out there and get the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then, um, right in the middle of it, uh, when just when you know everyone thought it was starting to take off, uh, my contract expired and they weren't going to renew it. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was it. It, it. Was it a bit weird? Do you think they weren't looking at your contract because it's not? typical for WWE if they're intending to let a guy go for the last six months to the last year to be trying different things. I know, you know? I, I don't, and that's another thing which, you know, I don't know what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and maybe it's something I did wrong. I'll take responsibility for it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's weird and never did I think my contract would expire because like you said, six months out, I'm st- they're still trying things with me. I'm mm-hmm. thinking, oh, I have nothing to worry about. Yeah. And then um, in February of 03, my contract came up February 28th. Um, and on the 14th, was, we were in Los Angeles, and I wrapped us and I wrestled Booker T. I was brought in the office and, and just told my contract wasn't going to be renewed, and um, this would be the last night I'd be on TV, um, and uh, you know, we can work, maybe work again together in the future. But mm-hmm. That was it. Mm-hmm. And so it was like a, uh, it was like a, it was a, you know, a, like a divorce mm-hmm. that I didn't know was coming. Mm-hmm. You know, it was mm-hmm. like, I was the happy husband at home, and all of a sudden my wife came home and said, okay, here's your papers. Mm-hmm. And, oh, what, huh, what? It was a long flight. I uh, flew from LA home to Miami. It was a long, long flight, and and a long. I said, you know, under contract, I couldn't. I was still under contract for two weeks. I couldn't, couldn't make contact with anyone about work. So you sit for two weeks. and You're going, man. I don't know what's going to happen. Come. Is someone you know, going to hire me? Yeah. It's... I don't know, and you know, I I don't know, but. Um, come the first of of March, when it hit, literally. 1201, my contract expired. I never had more phone calls in seven days than I had in the last seven years. Mm-hmm. And at that point, it dawned on me that maybe, you know, I'm not washed up. Uh, you know, something just happened. It wasn't me. Mm-hmm. And that was a very relieving, relieving feeling when people started calling me and saying, okay, dealer, we need you to come here. We want you to come here. We want you to come here. And it's like, okay. <sighs> All right, okay, we can go on with life, okay? Okay, there's life after this. So that was a, that was a hmm, trying two weeks there. Did it rejuvenate you to be able to, because of course on an independent show, you've got much more control over your character. Yeah. Obviously not the match, but your character, how you're portrayed. You right. don't have to be a genie and you don't have to right. be a racist thug. Did that help you get back into your, your psychological momentum? Yeah, I mean, career? it'll, you know, freedom is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, the ability to control your own character, your own destiny is great. Um, you know, going on an independent show, the guys are like, hey, what do you want to do? How can we, you know, mm-hmm. what do you want to do with your character? How can we help you out? Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's just a wonderful feeling. And yes, that rejuvenates you, gets you going again, gets your, gets your juices going again. You know, it's just the weird part is, um, before I used to look around, I was the youngest person in the locker room, and everybody looks at me. I'm the oldest guy in the locker room and I'm a little scared. <laughs> That's the only bad part about the independence is now I'm the vet and I'm going, oh, geez. Everybody's looking at me for advice. Mm-hmm. That's the only bad thing. But uh, yeah, it gets you going again. It gets you fired up again. And, you know, if anybody who's seen me on a show, I don't, I don't go out there and just take nights off because of name value. Mm-hmm. You know, I give a promoter twice as much in, what he, you know, in the ring than what he pays me. Mm-hmm. Um, just as just me. That's just my style. Mm-hmm. So I, you'll never see me just lay in the ring and grab a headlock and, or, or pass out in the corner or, or whatever. Um, I'll go out there and give you 120, 130%. When you were released, what were the initial promotions that worked best with? I mean, of course, you worked with NWA TNA. NWA, it was NWA TNA. Um, there were companies in, in Detroit, uh, Border City Championship Wrestling, mm-hmm. um, a ton of independents all around Florida, NWA Florida. Um, uh, 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 I'm thinking of um, uh, All Star Pro Wrestling, and, and, and there's a, a ton, a ton of promotions. And then uh, FWA gave me a call, and they wanted me to come over here. Right. So I mean, it was just initially huge outcry of, of people calling, and finally, uh, a dream of mine finally came true. All Japan Pro Wrestling finally made the call and asked me to come over, and that to me was uh, okay. Right. There's now right. I've, I've kind of got a little security again now because mm-hmm. major companies bringing me in again. Mm-hmm. So um, there was promotion out there. I too many to name, and if I name, start naming some, I'll, I'll embarrass myself by not naming others. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, guys, you know, promoters like, you know, Frank Goodman on down uh, have really, really been good to me. So I'm very, very lucky and very happy. When you first went to NWA TNA, which is, of course, number two promotion in the U.S. right mm -hmm. now, um, it was fairly early in their existence. They're only six months or so in. Right, right. Uh, what was the atmosphere like in the, in the locker room? Very, very uh, jovial. Mm -hmm. um, the feeling of something special was happening here. Mm -hmm. um, this could be the company, mm -hmm. was the feeling. Mm -hmm. um, this could be the one to put us over the top, to bring a competitive business back to the United States. Mm -hmm. That was the feeling, that's, and it's still majority of the feeling in there now, it's just a little different now. Mm -hmm. What do you attribute that to? Um, it just seems like, I don't know, bookings all over the place. I liken TNA to an all-star team. Mm -hmm. You've got all-star talent up and down the roster just in the wrong positions. Mm -hmm. um, you got Raven, who's been here for two years, who should have been world champ three times by now. You got AJ Styles, who I believe is the next evolution in this business. You got, you got up and down the roster, Christopher Daniels, up and, you know, guys who come in there, amazing red, I'm, I'm, once again, I'll embarrass myself, you got a great tag team, America's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. And it just, Every, something's not clicking. I don't know what it is. We're, we're, let's see, they started in 2002 or in 2004 now. It's been over two years mm -hmm. since they started. Uh, do you think that uh, perhaps an indication of the, the problems that you might perceive and a lot of people perceive in booking might be reflected in the fact that last weekend they had a pay-per-view and I mean they've had two years with guys like Chris Daniels, mm -hmm. guys like, could have been guys like you, of course you did work with them right, but right. it never became cemented. Right. Uh, guys like Raven of course, guys like AJ Styles and at the pay-per-view last Sunday the main event was Kevin Nash, was Scott Hall, was Randy Savage, and all the guys that have been there for two years are largely in the same position they were two years ago. Right, and they're not, you know, it's like, and there's no disrespect to any of those guys who, you know, who got brought in, mm -hmm. but when you build a company around people for two years, and your first big pay-per-view, your pay-per-view that's gonna just cement the, the future of your company, none of your boys who you've been building for two years can even sniff the main event, mm -hmm. to me is wrong. Mm -hmm. Because all that says is, guys, um, go out there and do your stuff. But ladies and gentlemen at home, wait soon. There'll be real wrestlers in the ring in the main event. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it said. Yeah. And, and of course, the real wrestlers are people that they will always perceive as people who are older. Yes. And always perceive as from a different company. Yes. And will always cost so much more than the wrestlers they've developed Absolutely. themselves. And, and, and here's the, the, the ironic thing is the guys who busted their behinds for two years to allow TNA to earn the money to pay these guys to bring them in for this pay-per-view, these guys won't, may not even be part of the company. You know, these, mm. these big name wrestlers will probably be there two, three, four shows. Mm. And then they're gone and it falls back on the guys who got slighted to be in the main event. Okay, let's do it again. Mm -hmm. Cre creatively, what did you think of your run in TNA? Were you perhaps not as concerned about because you, you were taking other bookings as well for a period of time? But or? you know, uh, you know, creatively at first, I thought things were good. Mm -hmm. um, I thought things were going well, and then um, um, it started to teeter off. So I was like, okay, let me, I'll get other bookings somewhere. You know, this is not, mm -hmm. TNA is not my bread and butter. It's just mm -hmm. a company I work for. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we just had a conflict of interest, and, and, you know, things happen, and mm -hmm. then we just parted ways. I mean, no big issue, no, no, big, no big scandal, just don't want to work there anymore. I mean, that's just, just it. Well, we've seen you in so many companies all over the world. What can we expect from you now in the next 12 months? What's the game plan? You know, uh, pretty much I'm going out there. I'm staying in Japan a lot. Uh, I want to stay. I want to come to the UK maybe three times a year. I don't want to, you know, too terribly. And I think a guy's habit is to come over here way too much and mm -hmm. they become normal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something special about Americans who come in. Mm -hmm. um, and just like if you go to America and there's something special about Brits or, or the Scots or the Irish that come over and you're like, oh, there's something special about them. But if they're part of the regular roster. You don't want to flood it. Yeah. 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 So I want to come to the UK maybe three, three more times in the next 12 months. I'll go to, I'll go to Japan um, every month and then just do tons and tons of independence all around. Mm -hmm. And just uh, keep going out there shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> all on that note, thank you very much for joining us here in the Backpack Report. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been D'Lo Brown. Cheers. Peace. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, it's time to see if you guys are paying attention because just a couple of weeks ago, we had the beautiful Jasmine St. Clair right here in studio. She, of course, represents 3PW from Philadelphia. Well, you want 200 pounds of merchandise. 
from the Wrestling Channel online store, www.thewrestlingchannel.tv slash shop. Answer a question about 3PW. Very simple one. Do you know the answer? The question is, who is the current 3PW heavyweight champion? Is it A, Rock and Rebel, B, Roadkill, or C, the Fallen Angel Christopher Daniels? You text your answer, Blake A, Blake B, or Blake C, depending on your answer, to 88066. Each entry is a buck fifty, and make sure you have them in by Thursday night at midnight for the chance to win 200 pounds of great merchandise. They're coming in left and right from countries all over the world. It is indeed the Immortal TBR Q&A. And this week, let's see if you get lucky. The first question comes from Anthony, who would like to know, Dear Blake, love the show first of all. Thank you very much, Anthony. What do you think of WWE's policy of once in a while turning a face into a heel and vice versa? Basically a good guy turning bad and a bad guy turning good. Uh, do you prefer other promotions tactics with wrestlers? Example, Christopher Daniels in Ring of Honor, who has always been a bad guy. Also, you should do a Bagpipe Report Supercard with all the interviews, in particular AJ Styles in a recent interview with Johnny Storm. Thank you very much for the letter, Anthony. Uh, to be honest with you, WWE's policy of, of having guys turn back and forth is uh, everybody does it. I mean, it's not a new thing. I mean, wrestlers' personalities have evolved and changed as time goes on. In fact, Ricky the Dragon's Steamboat is a bit of a legend for the fact that he has always been a good guy. In the 30-something years he's been in the business, he has always been a good guy. And I can't think of anybody else who matches that description. Um, and the Bagpipe Report super card of interviews, you never know. There's been a little bit of talk about it and some ideas thrown around, so if it happens, we'll let you know. And our last letter for today comes from Paul and Maidenhead, who would like to know. Hi there, Blake. I have heard that this John Cena injury business is all pure fantasy. Can you confirm? I know he was going to start in a movie, so surely this is all in bad taste. WWE.com are even letting fans send a get well card to Cena, and there isn't even anything wrong with him, is there? Also, I've heard that Stone Cold will be returning before WrestleMania 21. Would he wrestle, and can you confirm? Love the show, many thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, we talked about this a few weeks ago. There's no confirmation on Steve Austin. I wouldn't be surprised if he was back before mania but he's not confirmed by a long shot so as possible but it hasn't happened yet uh, as far as the John Cena injury yes he was going to, to shoot a movie and in, is it in bad taste well I mean there's a, there's a lot of talk because we talked about a few weeks ago uh, Johnny Devine of NWA TNA fame actually had a legit he was legitimately stabbed in an altercation after uh, being at a bar and some people think that maybe they're they're ragging on him and if that's the case by doing the storyline in WWE that is bad taste, but if it's a simple case of an injury, well, that's part of storylines, and like it or love it or hate it and want to begrudge it, it's going to be a part of wrestling until the day wrestling dies. Now let's just review some of the upcoming events in the UK and Ireland. On Thursday the 25th of November, All Star Wrestling is in Southampton. On Friday the 26th of November, Premier Promotions presents a wrestling spectacular at the Gosport Thorn Gate Halls. On Saturday the 27th, the Independent Wrestling Federation has a show in Gateshead. Check out NWA UK Hammerlock on Saturday the 27th of November in Cumbria. And finally, FWA presents Gold Rush on Sunday, November 28th at the Bronxbourne Civic Hall. Okay, let's check out what's coming up this coming week on the Wrestling Channel. First of all, we head to 3PW in Philadelphia indeed. First, we've got Rob Ekos versus Nate Matson, And then one-on-one, -on -one, Joey Matthews versus Jerry Lynn. Then CZW Fake UTV. It's going to be a technical classic, no doubt, as Super Dragon takes on Chris Hero. Then it's tag team action as Blackout takes on the SAT. You looking for action? Look no further than Major League Wrestling. We've got a four-way dance. In one corner, Sanjay Dutt. In another, Jack Evans. Another, Chase Rance. And the other, it's Puma. All four guys coming together for some high-impact explosive wrestling. Then we make it down and dirty one-on-one -on -one as Chad Collier goes up against Low Key. Then flick it right over to 428. Yes, that's right. It's the Wrestling Channel Reload. Classic Memphis, we've got Dirty Dutch Mantel versus the immortal Ravishing Rick Rude and Jerry the King Lawler versus Humongous. 
Okay, that has been another week of the Bagpipe Report. Make sure you check out the wrestlingchannel.tv. You got forums, you got shops, you got information about wrestling all over the UK and Ireland and way beyond. Also, the bagpipereport.com. You can get photos from right here. This week's episode completely for free online and a whole lot more. Stay tuned to TWC because next week we're going to be back. We're going to have the top news, the top interviews, a couple little surprises, so keep it right here. Next Friday, 8 p.m., the Bagpipe Report on the Wrestling Channel.